what, what I want to do today is just kind of fill you in on some of the space uh, pr programs that I worked on and, uh, and what, what motivated me at the time and some of the missions themselves, sort of in that order. I'll probably go through the timeline three times and uh, the people that influenced me were very important, of course, yeah. Especially when you're about 10 or 12 years old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the, oh, th this is all online, by the way. You can see the whole 20 whatever pages of it is on, on your website. Now, the people that I wrote up, I feel that were the real pioneers were first Dr. Goddard, who wrote, who uh, designed the first uh, liquid rocket. And I'm from Boston, and he launched the first rocket in 26 out by Worcester. And uh, funny, I, I never saw the uh, Paul Revere House until about 20 years ago <laughs> growing up in Boston. So last month, I went back there on something, and I drove out with some cousins, and we saw the actual site where the first rocket was fired from. There's an obelisk about like this. Of course, there's a picture of me leaning on the obelisk, which is a great word, obelisk. You know. <laughs> uh, th then there was uh, Hermann Oberth, German physicist. And uh, he wrote a couple of books about space and was Winter von Braun's, who's the next guy, was Winter von Braun's uh, professor. And as it turned out, uh, Oberth was called in to help make a movie, A Woman on the Moon, I think it was 28. And uh, they called him in to come up with some sets and stuff to make it look realistic. And uh, he did that and then the fourth guy, Kraft Ericke, who was also German, saw that movie 11 times when he was about 10 or 11 years old. So it's kind of interesting how all these guys came together and how at that same age, they, they all lit up and, and devoted the rest of their life to a space. And their enthusiasm was just, just amazing. It just jumped out all over the place uh, just because watching a few movies. And the uh, von Braun, of course, ended up when he left Germany <clears throat> to be the uh, technical director of uh, Huntsville and then Marshall Space Flight. And uh, von Braun uh, heard about the von Opel race car, which is a rocket driven race car when he was a boy. And he got some firecrackers and von Braun stuck them on the back of a wagon, I guess, and w went downtown and fired them, and he, he created quite a, quite a stir. And he was uh, arrested. So that, I think he was arrested once more. The, the Nazis arrested him years later, but yeah. Uh, he was arrested, his father bailed him out, and uh, he, uh, he, he survived that mishap with, with his rockets. Uh, and then Kraft Ericke, who was a young engineer, very uh, advanced in thinking, worked for von Braun at Peenemunde. These last three Germans all ended up in Peenemunde during the Second World War and developed the V2. Uh, and uh, Ericke, who then left and went to Convair in the 50s, which I followed. I, I went there because I wanted to work for him because he was, he was the cat's meow, this guy. He was even on a, on, on a Wheaties box. I mean, that, that's how popular Kraft Ericke was at the time. Uh, uh, so uh, after, after Pina Mundi, then they all came over here on a paperclip program, it was called, and they all worked for us, luckily. Uh, Von Braun's brother, this is kind of interesting, Von Braun's brother worked for him at Pina Mundi, and they were all <laughs> taking their notes and trying to hide them from the Russians. They wanted the Americans to capture them. And uh, Von Braun's brother was w wandering around kind of after the war was over. It wasn't officially over. And he saw this American private on a bicycle driving down a dirt road. And he was th that was the first American they had seen. So he ran out and said, my, my brother invented the V2. We want to surrender to you. <laughs> so that's, that was the beginning of how they all came over to the American side. Yeah, uh, Just amazing. My, my brother invented a V2. I love that line. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, they, they all had this common thread in becoming excited about space. It was just that they read books uh, about space 
science, science fiction, and some of them saw a movie. Uh, in my case, I saw a Flash Gordon movie in, in the mid, early 40s, which, which got me tuned on, which I'll get into a little bit later. Okay. Uh, anyway, we all had this burning desire for some reason, and Eric e, uh, said it was, he felt there was a calling. There were just a, a few of these people that we, we just dedicated every minute of our life to it. It was so exciting. And prior to Sputnik, nobody cared a bump about us. <clears throat> we were all kind of off, off in the closet. It was rough. When I was in college, my, my, uh, I'd lived with two aunts for a couple of years because we were close, close to the university. And they, they called my mother one night and said, your son, I don't know about him. He's got these pictures on the wall. He, he, he worries us. But they were just rockets and planets. And I think my mother says, uh, leave him alone. He, he probably knows what he's doing. But everybody was not tuned in until Sputnik. So th there was like a stigma almost attached to being interested in space for a long, long time. And then, of course, Kennedy came out with this speech. And, and then the country really rallied around it itself. And, and from there on, it was straight up. Uh, again, the, the public took on this enormous enthusiasm for space. Uh, as we were talking a, a little while ago, this, what we're in now, I think is the opposite of where we were during the Kennedy era with, with the space and uh, going to the moon and beat the Russians. Beat the Russians was, was the whole thing. And uh, it was so exciting. People would just, if, if you, uh, like I'd be on an airplane looking at view graphs, sketching and writing, and people would just flock around you. It was just such a wonderful feeling that the country really wanted to go to space. And, uh, and they, they supported it. Yeah, it was just wonderful. So it was the excitement of the era that, that I remember very well. And the sound of the atlases taking off. I, I, I was on a lot of the atlas early launches. And it was just, just wonderful. Uh, I have a who and a what influenced me. My, my, my parents were wonderful. They, they just, whatever I wanted to do, uh, they, they were always behind me. And then my grandmother, when, in 1943, gave me a Kodak <coughs> Brownie camera. You know those old box cameras? And for some reason, photography just lit up. And I got into the technical side right from there. Took the boys club, had a uh, darkroom course. <clears throat> learn how to develop and all that. Can still see my mother in her fur coat, the first picture I developed, <laughs> all dressed up one Sunday. So, but photography kind of launched me into the entire technical world. And then the same same boys club had this Thursday night movie for kids, two cents. And they had a movie, but they also had a Flash Gordon series. So I watched the Flash Gordon series, and that was it. That, that was the moment that I said, that's what I'm going to do. And about 20 years ago, I was at uh, Universal Studios, and they actually still have those old movies. <clears throat> and and, and I, I asked the guy, can you, can you just find one? They were very nice. They went back. I told them who I was. They, they went back, and they, and they, they played one they had it on a DVD. <clears throat> and it was like a s silver rocket. You could see the strings. And, and they had a cigarette coming out the back. And it's going around this way. Of course, the smoke's going up. But when you're a kid, it, you know, it was just enough to just make it work. So that, that, that's how I kind of get impressed with, with the whole scene. Um, and th then it was the Second World War. And the Germans uh, were doing some rocketry. So God, I, I, I read, I became a news junkie then when I was like 12 years old. <laughs> and still am. Yeah just trying to find anything that was written about the, the rocketry and the buzz bombs, the V2s, just from the rockets, rockets of it. Not, little did I know that the guys that worked on it, I, I would know later <laughs> when I grew up <laughs> and, and, uh, and worked for some of them. Yeah. So that, that was interesting. Uh, in high school, I, I got into uh, movie cameras. I had a little uh, eight millimeter movie camera and uh, the coach asked me if I could take football movies. I took one game, and then they bought me uh, 16 millimeter movies, uh, cameras, and film. And for, for four years, then I continued to take take the movies there, the, the football games. Then I got a 3D camera, which was really way out. Remember those 3D uh, stereo realists made in Germany? 
So I used one of those for about five years and I just developed my photography around the 3D. Because that, that depth really helps you with the composition. And uh, then college, I, I took double E, like you say, because there, there were no classes in rocketry or space or anything. I could have gone into uh, astronomy, but I, I didn't want to do that. I, didn't want, I wanted to be an engineer and build stuff and go there. I didn't just want to look and see. I wanted to go there. So that, that's where I, I kind of came from. And I worked. It was a co-op school. Northeastern in Boston, you worked for three months and went to school for three months. So I, I asked for a job down at Fairchild Guided Missiles in Long Island. And I worked there for a few years in the work periods and worked on the uh, uh, petrol missile, <clears throat> which was a flying uh, torpedo. And God, it was so, so much fun for a young guy in college to work on those things. I worked on the engines and the guidance. I get into guidance and control, which, which kind of got me in photography into guidance and control. Yeah, as, as you'll see here. So that, that kind of a school was, was just terrific to have experience in, in your work. It was just wonderful. Uh, after college, I had 24 job offers as a double E, and, and this is 57, and Hughes hired me out to uh, Los Angeles, Culver City. And I came out, and in two or three months, they didn't have anything like, like they told me they were going to do. Nothing. So I said, this is, I'm wasting my time here. So I found a company that was launching Nikes up in uh, uh, Canada, Hudson Bay, you know, 30, 30 degrees below zero. And I went up there for a few months because it was cold weather testing, of course. <laughs> and I uh, launched Nikes and learned like the entire system from that standpoint. And uh, also had a nose cone that would score. We, we would fire the Nike at a drone. And as it went by, it would score. You didn't want to really hit the drone because they were expensive. So it was a target that you just barely wanted to miss. So I, uh, then one night, the nose cone failed, and I went out with these big gloves and four, four, four bolts. And I can still see myself trying to put that nose cone on uh, in, in the 30 degree weather there. Um, after that, I. Uh, I'm, I'm still writing papers. I, I wrote a paper when, when I was an undergraduate, and the, it was, I mean, I, I didn't take anything easy. It was a solar system escape. And I used the sol solar cells and ion engines. So that was the first step into publishing a paper. And uh, I, I published a few more manned Mars missions with the American Rocket Society, which was the place to be at that point, yeah. And then, I said, I'm going to go work with Kraft Ericke in San Diego. So I, I went down there, they interviewed me, and I got in. And the Atlas was just coming on as an ICBM. It was our first ICBM. And they said, why don't you just go out to the launch sites, it was Air Force, and just monitor I anything you can, and you find failure modes, engines or what have you, and just document all that. So in, in doing that, I was able to understand the entire atlas itself. And shortly afterwards, uh, Convair was given the Mercury mission because the atlas was the best booster to put man in space. So I, I just fell right, right into the Mercury program. And uh, the Mercury capsule had, had, had a much different shape than, than the uh, than the uh, nose cone of the ICBM. So they were afraid that something might happen when they launched it, because it would not be as stable. So they, they came to me and said, you know, you, you're good with cameras, you know, what, what can we do? I said, well, we had tracking cameras, but I said, you know, you need better lens. So I went to Nikon, they, they came up with this lens for me, and uh, they launched it, it blew up, at the maximum Q, you know, when it's going real fast and it's, uh, and the air is still quite heavy. It blew up and the pictures showed exactly where that thing blew up, the, the uh, exact spot on the Atlas. Now the Atlas was just a stainless steel gas bag, that, that, which was its beauty. It had, it had no structure except the tank. It was just a thin stainless steel tank. You couldn't transport it without being inflated. You had to pump it up or it would sag. So th they found out from the pictures exactly where that blew. And they, they, they almost were predicting what would happen. And then they put a belly band around it, 
they just put an extra thickness of, of the same material. And then, then we were on to the Mercury program. Then they team me up with Deke Slayton. Remember the Seven Astronauts, the uh, Right Stuff movie? Uh, Slayton was, was the, uh, I think he was the tallest guy, and uh, he and I were, were teamed, I uh, was his counterpart, and for the purpose of deciding what to do with the escape rocket, which I'm sorry the Apollos didn't have later, and the space shuttles, yeah. Anyway, uh, it was funny, he used to fly into uh, Patrick at, at Cape, Cape Canaveral, and I'd meet him, and it, we'd win a hang, he'd change his clothes, we'd, we'd, we'd go have breakfast. <clears throat> and, and, and then we'd sit around and discuss, you know, the parameters and whatever that, that we should be looking at to signal that the atlas is going. And, and I knew all the, all the tricks with the atlas. <clears throat> and, and then we would pull him off with this, this escape rocket. And we got involved with the landing in the ocean also. Not that that was our job, but he asked me to work with the... Uh, uh, who was the contractor? No, no, the capsule. Uh, Grumman, Gr Grumman, I think Grumman made the uh, Mercury capsule. So then I, I went, to, went there and we tried to work out some arrangement for a diff little different landing on the ocean. He didn't like that idea, <laughs> landing on the, that hard ocean. Uh, Slayton was really a neat guy, terrific guy. Uh, I never met any of the others. They were always kind of by themselves or in a group for that photo. I think they all met once, I think, for that photo. <laughs> uh, so then, then uh, when the Mercury, when I, I got, got out of the Mercury program, then because of Kennedy's speech, they announced the Man on the, Man on the Moon program. So <clears throat> NASA let out three contracts. Uh, North American got one, we got one, and I think Martin got the other one. And uh, about halfway through, they changed the name to Apollo. <laughs> So the study then became Apollo, and we, we were going, going to the moon from that point on. We didn't have the booster, but this is a huge hardware contract, so the competition was enormous. And I, I did the guidance and control section. I was the, the leader on, on that discipline. And uh, so toward the end, I'm still writing papers in between. Toward the end, we, we knew it wasn't, we weren't going to win, the, you know, the G2. Uh, North American had just finished the X-15 program and they did real well and NASA loved them. They, they had a lot of influence. So I, I wrote a paper on uh, like a lunar base, uh, landing the multiple uh, rockets manned, clustered around a lunar base. And I gave it at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. And when I finished, I walked off and there were like eight guys in suits from JPL. They said, you gotta, you know, you, you gotta get off this, this man stuff down, <laughs> down there with Eric and you, you gotta come, come work for us. So uh, uh, I talked to Eric and he says, this is good. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll work on the man and you go work on the other man. So we, we se separated, but we were friends for life. Uh, so that, that's how I got into JPL from another one of these conceptual papers that I wrote. Uh, Funny, when the, one of the first assignments of JPL was surveyor, you know, the soft lander. We needed that to know what the surface of the moon would be for Apollo. So uh, I was on the board, uh, what do they call it, the uh, selection committee technical guys to pick the winner, and, I, and, 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 we, and we picked the Hughes, which is funny because they were the company I, I left because they were doing nothing. Hughes learned fast, and we awarded it to Hughes. So Hughes won the surveyor program. About a year or two into it, they were having real troubles with the soft landing. Uh, and they, they, were, they, they couldn't quite control it. It was you know, just a little beyond them at the time. So uh, they, they sent me down to the facility, Culba City, where they were doing all this, by helicopter every day. I'm, I'm flying down from Pasadena to Culba City on a helicopter in my, my my job, they were told, was I was just trying to help them with, with, with the uh, problem that they were having with the soft landing the technique. But in reality, I was going to convert that soft lander, if they couldn't make it work, to an orbiter. 
And I then had a little contract up at uh, Aerojet where they had the, uh, they had a lot of good optical people, infrared, that's where the infrared <coughs> uh, brains came from way back. And we came up with like a little uh, camera, slit scanner, so that we could get real high resolution in orbit and count craters and rocks and stuff. It was, it was, it was the, the best way around it if we couldn't land, because we needed an answer. You know, what was the surface like? You gotta touch it, really, yeah. But this was a good way out. Anyway, I, uh, I, I had this, I had a whole team ready in case NASA pushed the button and said, they're not cutting it. So it turned out they finally made it work <laughs> and we didn't have to use all this, but that, that scanner was used la later on other planetary missions. So it kind of uh, served its purpose as a backup if needed and then worked out well later. But that, that was terrific, yeah. I met, uh, another person I met was uh, uh, Charles Stock Draper, who ran the lab up at uh, MIT. He was the guidance guru of the world. And uh, Clyde Tombaugh, don't want to leave Clyde out. Clyde discovered Pluto in 1930. And I met him at JPL, and I visited him in uh, New Mexico State University. He taught there for years. A real character. He built his own telescopes. He discovered Pluto up at the Flagstaff, and uh, he, he, he took a shine to me. So you know, you know how it is. You just become friends with people and all that. But one time, I met him. He says, "You know, I'd like to tell you the story of the evening that I discovered Pluto." I says, "Good." He says, "Tape it." I said, "Okay." So I, I ran. I got a tape recorder, and you sat there. Uh, he used a blink and powder. You know, you take a picture of the sky and a couple of days later, you take another one and you just keep looking. And if there's nothing moving, nothing blinks. So, he, so the, these two plates, one blinked, you got another one, another one blinked. So he, he said, he knew then that there was another planet out there. We, we, we won't go into what, it's been downgraded. <laughs> it's still a planet for me. <laughs> I called his wife after that happened. He's gone, I called his wife and she says, uh, he, he, would, he, he, he would go with the flow. Yeah. So he said, he didn't know what to do. It was like two in the morning. Should, should I run in and, and wake my boss up? He says, no. So he walked around for 45 minutes in the cold up at Flagstaff and said, uh, he, he knew for 45 minutes that he was the only person anywhere that knew there was a ninth planet. And, and when you... I, I have the tape, it's lost in my office. <laughs> misplaced, it's not lost, it's misplaced. I, I would have brought it here, it is so, he's so emotional. And this was like in the 80s, this was 50 years after he did it. And, and when you just push the button, and he was like right there, and all excited, the enthusiasm was just fantastic, yeah, 50 years later. And uh, uh, I don't think he ever really got his due for discovering the planet. I, I, I thought it was great to know a guy that actually discovered a planet. You know what I mean? And talk to him, call him up. I did it with him. If you, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. F fame comes different ways, I guess, right? Uh, so I was doing real good at JPL, writing a lot of papers. And then uh, two of the, the lead scientists bolted and started a new company called Space General. And uh, they got it going. And about a year later, they says, come with us and, and come up with the front end stuff, you know, the, the uh, concepts, and, and we'll get studies with you and then we'll get the hardware later. And they made me a deal. They says, you, you come with, with, with us, we'll, we'll give you two days a week, three days you work on your contracts. You see, I had to win the contracts. <laughs> I had to get all the, the NASA money. But the other two days, you do anything you want and we will support you with art, uh, equipment, whatever you want, the other two days. Because they knew if I could take her around, I'd come up with something else. <laughs> and that was great. So I finally went, I left JPL and went to Space General. So then for the next seven or eight years, I, I, I wrote uh, papers about like flybys, uh, orbiters, landers for all the planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, asteroids, and comets. And I just put these out, like every two months I'm doing something else, uh, a, a different, different mission, and, 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 and we're getting study contracts, sole source. They would send the contracts to me in, in Space General, and I had like about 10 people. And you know, the, the artists and the uh, gra graphic designers and you know, 
the specialist in, in each discipline. So it, it, it was just terrific. And uh, I, I could hardly go home. I mean, it was just like a kid in a candy shop. Yeah, because I, I, I'd work on that. I had a big office with, with actually two, two desks. One, one was for them, one was for me. <laughs> but the me worked out for them also. So it's just a wonderful uh, six or seven years at, uh, at Space General. And no hold bar, anything I wanted to do. And the contracts just kept coming. and. They, they were so happy. Well, some of the uh, uh, space uh, uh, concepts that, that I had that, that may be recognizable to you. Okay. I'll go all the way back when I was a kid, start back there again. My first concept, uh, color film came out. In, well, it was out in the 30s, but we couldn't get it. About 47, 48, I got a roll of color film. And everybody was complaining about red eye. You know, all the magazines, red eye, red eye. What's this red eye? So I, I just, <laughs> it, was, it was so dumb. Uh, I, I just took my little Argus camera with the flash and put it out on an arm because you had to know it's just in and out. You know, you look, you're looking at your retina, that's all. So anyway, it worked, and I wrote, I wrote the editor, and then they asked me, they, I, they had me write a, a, an article. I, it was like popular photography in 1948. So the 14-year-old kid wrote this article about how to eliminate red eye. And it, it's the same as it ever was. You just separate the, the lens from the flash source. That's all, yeah. And these little cameras still have red eye. I don't care what, how many times they flicker it, or, but they are using software now. It's getting better. Yeah. So anyway, that, that was my first idea that, that was recognized. Uh, then in, in, uh, in college, I wrote that article about the... Uh, solar system escape probe. And uh, th th then when I got into the Ericke group, I, I was well established anyway, but he, he really motivated me because he was such a wonderful guy. And I wrote to spin or not to spin. I was, I was a Shakespearean guy. And it just seemed nice because everybody was arguing, how, how do we, remember, we, we, we're on the way to Mars now. We're sending men to Mars. This was in our head at the time, okay? So all these things were prefaced on sending men to Mars or other planets. So uh, Von Braun had that toroid, which you, you see in 2001, basically, in a movie. And there's a picture of another one from Langley. It's like a, a six-sided. And then I, I took the, uh, <clears throat> a single spacecraft and separated the, the fuel tanks and the, and the people module with a cable and spun it up, much cheaper. And you, it, this was easily done, I spun it up. And then, that's when I, after I did that, I said, why don't I put something in the center? They, they, they complained about the fact that it's spinning, the uh, inertials and inertial systems, accelerometers, gyros would, would be messed up. Because they're going this way, but they're also going this way. So I said, let me, let me come up with that. So I, I put in the center in the pivot point, you know, with the, with the coupling, this uh, optical unit that was uh, prefaced on this mosaic guidance system. And I would look and take pictures of, of the planets approaching and asteroids and comets and use in the stars behind it and just use that to find out where we were on board in real time. And that, that was the American Rocket Society in 61, and two nights before, I, I was in the Guidance and Control Committee. I, I was like the guy that was still wet behind the ears. So the, the, the paper was accepted, we, we had a dinner or something, and uh, turned out to be my nemesis, then C. Stark Draper came and said, hey kid, you, you, you're not presenting that paper. You're not giving that paper. I said, what's the matter? He says, it's all optical. You've got to use gyros. And, and, and the accelerometers. I says, no you don't. So it, it hit the fan. He called Caltech. And like, I'm getting telegrams. You don't remember telegrams, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was a guy downtown that he got it and he cut it out and glued it on the paper and then the guy on a motorcycle brought it to you. This was not texting you. So uh, anyway, Caltech in, in MIT, he, uh, Draper's MIT, I'm Caltech, so God, they went at it for about a day and a half. And then uh, Pickering, my boss, Bill Pickering, <clears throat> he, 
he, he called me up. I got the word beat this phone. He called me up and says, you give that paper. You know, you got something going there. You give it, you're on, forget Draper. Yeah. So, uh, so I did, yeah. But it was kind of like two days. It was just, just a struggle between these two big institutions. We all go through this, you know. And uh, so that's fine. The funny thing is that, that it became digital photography, you see. It, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't get it. I'm not sure I got it either. It, to, to the, the totality of what, what that, that mosaic uh, paper would, would end up, yeah. And it gets even funny about uh, a couple of months ago, I, I get calls from editors, usually a new digital magazine, digital photography, and they call me to interview me because I invented digital photography. You know, and th this one guy, he said, uh, th that's great, I, I know, I understand. That was 1961. He said, what have you done for us lately? <laughs> I said, do you have, uh, this is funny, do you have any, any of your competitors uh, magazine like uh, uh, Popular Photography? He says, yeah, I says, pick up Popular Photography this month and uh, turn it to page 58 and there was an ad in there for my, for my little uh, white balance cap. I always have one of these with me. Yeah. You put this on the lens to get white balance. And I says, that one is like three months old. So it, it kind of, I said, do you want to know what else I did in between? You know, <laughs> uh, you want me to fill every, another 150 products in between? Uh, outside of the space stuff, yeah. So it, it's just one of those moments where you, you, you just, the guy asked for it and you, you gave it to him and it, was, it made you feel good, you know. <laughs> it was good, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, what, what, a couple of things I did at Space Channel where I had the extra time, I, uh, because we were going to the moon, the 16G, and everybody said, geez, you know, how, how do you simulate that? So I got this big, uh, like, 50-foot conveyor belt, okay, and I leaned it, leaned it up. We, we went out, we were making Airby rockets, so we went out to this, the factory area, and we leaned, calculated the angle, and got some bungee cords, okay? So here I am dangling, dangling down from the, from the ceiling, and you know, and, and walking on, on at the angle, which is one six G this way, of course, you still got it one G going down. But you could jump and you could do somersaults, you know, kind of like a simulator for one six G. Uh. And the wood got out and then NASA came in and looked it over and then uh, copied it three months later. <laughs> but you know, it was it was fine because we, we were getting contracts anyway, so it was a it was a freebie for them, yeah. Uh, they wanted the large expandable antennas. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's like six, six to eight foot diameter, maybe larger on the launch vehicle. So they would like to put like an 85 foot antenna in there. So that was one thing they threw out. So I went out and bought some uh, uh, like fiberglass rod, thin rod. And we got a canister like six foot and we coiled it up and then popped it out. Okay, so we, you know, and it was, a, it was like 20 foot, it wasn't 85, but you know, proof, of, proof of the pudding. So it would pop out. And then they said, well, it doesn't have any shape. I said, well, you know, you want everything. <laughs> At least we got, we, we got the, the frame out there. So then they, they sent that up to uh, Aerojet uh, Sacramento where they had a lot of chemists. And then they started to uh, develop a, uh, a rigidizable, you know, after you opened it up to get some surface that you could rigidize it and be good enough to whatever whatever wavelengths they were talking about yeah so that was like an inflatable uh antenna what i did then in my spare time i took some of that home so somebody took me on a camping trip i'm not a camper and we stayed in this horrible tent you know the poles my god this is just stupid all this tent stuff but i'm, I'm not an outside guy so so i made a tent out of the same material, and I call it snap tent. And you throw it out, and it would open. You know, you pulled it up flat was about it. You throw it out, and it would open. And I said, "Look, it's an instant tent." I call it snap tent. So I, I was the hero of the. Uh, it was a two and a half pound two man tent. At the time, that was really unique. You know. Yeah. So for a few years, I had somebody manufacture that for me. Yeah. But it was just like a side, all these little side things on. You know that that fell out. I guess that's technological transfer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, oh, and the metalized mylar. Shouldn't, shouldn't forget that. 
uh, you know, we're wrapping all the uh, uh, structures and cryo tanks with metalized mylar. I says, my God. So uh, I, I had a week off. I went to Boston to the company that made it. And I said, hey, I want to make a blanket for people out of this. They said, what are you talking about? So we, we developed a needle punch. I shouldn't be going into the consumer stuff, but it, it just you see how it just all moves around. We needle punch a lot of holes so it would breathe. And then we uh, attached uh, like a nice soft cotton to it so it was a blanket. And I sold that for years as a space blanket. N not available anymore, yeah. You know, these things come and go. But that, that was another technological transfer. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Aerojet and uh, uh, Space General started to come together because Aerojet had the contract to build the rocket engine for the nuclear rocket. Westinghouse did, did the reactor. Uh, Aerojet had the rocket engine up in Sacramento. So they, they, they pulled me and said, hey, can you and you guys this was right at the end of Apollo when Apollo was kind of dying. We were losing interest. They says, can you, can you pump this up? Because we, we want to keep this NERVA, it was called the NERVA program. Can you pump it up? I said, well, okay. So I, I did a couple of studies with, with these guys I had. And, and we, we, we just adapted it to, a, to a, again, a manned Mars mission. You know, and how, how much it would cost and how long it would take to build all the stuff. And uh, there, were, there were some technical problems in the reactor. And uh, before, before anything really developed from my work, including a lunar base, I had a lunar base with, with the reactor uh, there for the power plant, you know. Forget, forget the solar cell, <laughs> Let, let's put some real meat there. So uh, anyway, it got, it got canceled because Nixon came in and decided to uh, not, he decided to cancel that program and therefore the rest of my life with nuclear propulsion to Mars was over. And then Nixon went for the, for the shuttle. So he, he picked the space shuttle as the next generation. Yeah. So I was, I, I was devastated. <laughs> I thought it was the wrong direction. Because we, we, we had all these schedules. We, you know, we're going to man Mars. Come on, let's go. It never happened. I don't know if it ever will either. Yeah. Uh, more, more recently, some of, the, some of the things that I had that laid fallow for years, okay? The, uh, uh, remember when uh, NASA was using large spacecraft, one billion dollar spacecraft to, to do all the work and if it failed? So they, they decided, why don't we work with smaller spacecraft and launch them simultaneously or whatever? And that, that was a good idea. But the, uh, uh, tracking networks then would have to be looking at multiple missions and the cost then came back to the controllers on the ground and maybe they would need more, more antennas. So that, that, that was a real problem. They decided, why don't we do a lot of the navigation on board? Just like I had years before. So they, 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 they call me. It's nice when they call you up. And they, you know, I said, God, you guys got good memories. You know, <laughs> Remember this stuff from way back. So they decided to make what they called in 1998 the Deep Space One mission like a test bed for this and a few other things. Ion engines, they had a new ion engine. They had a new collector, solar collector to power the engine, the ions. So the, the whole thing was like a, a candy store for us kind of guys. <laughs> to look at new things, and mine went on it, and it worked, okay? So then, from then on, I uh, understand it saved them gazillion dollars, because they, they could now build a small camera and put it on board, and then they could uh, actually calculate using mostly asteroids. Asteroid background, stars, asteroids, and then know where they were, and they could in real time, without having to tie up the ground controllers for months and months, they could make maneuvers on board, and, and, and they proved it, that it worked. So that was, that, that, that was just so nice that it happened so, so many years later. But the, see, the concept was good, and, and, it, and it worked in my head, and it finally worked in the spacecraft, yeah. yeah. So that was, that was wonderful. Um, I also had an uh, asteroid lander. You know, the asteroids, or, or comet lander if you had to, you don't have much gravity, so 
you don't you don't land on them like that, right? There's no no, no gravity attraction. So uh, what do you do? So I had this look like a spider. I got all these pictures somewhere. Okay, <laughs> uh, landed with with the spider, and then I shot shot a harpoon in, and then just you know reeled it in, and then secured it to the surface. So um, the European Space Agency has a spacecraft out there called Rosetta. It's it's on the way now. Yeah. And uh, oddly enough, in August, just this last August, they used the picture trick I had to tell them where the asteroid was they were headed for to a higher degree than we knew from the ground. So they upgraded the accuracy of the orbit of the asteroid and the relationship of the spacecraft and, and the, the asteroid. So that, that worked on, on that way. They, they, they got the pictures of the asteroid. Now they're going to a comet, and they're going to land on the comet, and they're going to use this, this trick that I had to uh, attach themselves. To the, there's a little uh, lander that, that's going to come off the main bus, land, and then attach, and then take samples. The, uh, the Japanese uh, tried that a while ago, and uh, they're not sure whether they got any material. It's on the way back. It was a, they're returning some material. Maybe they don't. They're not sure what happened. So th th those are just some of, some of the ideas and some of the people. Uh, my my crew, th th like three o'clock, they'd be walking back and forth. Th they were looking for the afternoon break zone. Uh, I'd usually have some new new thing that w that related to what we we're doing that they could all run back and then you know design or whatever. So it was, it was, it, the, the daily breakthrough was, was what they call it. Everybody just wanted to work on this stuff with me because you know, I, was, I was on the way. <laughs> they knew if they worked in my group that it would be interesting and something new and nobody had ever been played, played with yet. And uh, uh, about w when I was winding down in the <laughs> mid, mid 70s, one of my best friends came up and said, what are you going to do when you run out of planets? I said, yeah, that, that, I said, I hadn't thought of that. I said, but, you know, there are a lot of stars out there. And we're going to have to just figure out probably radio astronomy. This is the 70s. Probably they can come up with some tricks to find out if there are other planets also. Yeah. And, uh, and it turned out I was right there, too, because, yes, there are. <laughs> At the time, a lot of people were just kind of, eh, we don't know if that was true, yeah. And there's always uh, the uh, Drake, Drake equation to, to work with, yeah. <laughs> that's good. So uh, th th that's just generally what, what I've been, it was exciting. Uh, the, the, the country was just turned on, and it was a wonderful period. The uh, Kennedy Camelot era, I guess they call it. Yeah. So uh, thank you, yeah, we, we can take, take some comments, questions here. The excitement, it was, it was all, all excitement. And, and Kraft Ericke, my guy, he, he, he would, they, they say when, when, when Sinatra walked into a room, you know, you knew he was there. When Ericke walked in, if you heard him talk for five minutes, you would, if you knew nothing about space, you would want to go work on it. He was just so exciting and, and such a, a warm, uh, honorable person. Yeah. And uh, just, just, just a wonderful guy. He, he, he helped me, he boosted me. I was already going and he, he, he gave me the extra stage <laughs> for the kicker, sure. Sure. So you expressed an interest in radio astronomy. Do you have any I ideas percolating in the back of your head that you want to explore? Uh, I, I, uh, this all started, I, I wrote a letter, I said, can I go look at your, at your uh, ALA? I want to go visit there, yeah, yeah. I think if I get closer to it, I'd probably, probably have some. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, there, there, there's so much, so much to do there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh and the, and the other thing, uh, of course, we, we, you know, I ran out of planets, but I can't get there anymore. You know, I mean, there are no spacecraft that can go there in a lifetime. You know, what I mean? <laughs> never mind. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, yes. There's the photography and, and, and astronomy are coming together somewhere. Uh, uh, yes, I am thinking that way. It hasn't quite snapped. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll take out my uh, this one again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So the the uh, era that you've described to us was essentially all government funded. Um, Perhaps with the new administration coming in, we'll see a brighter era ahead. I think time will tell on that. But I'd be curious as to what comments you have about uh, the commercial space industry, what it might bring to the future. Uh, what are your feelings about it? Excellent. They used to ask me that, that the similar question way back when we wanted to, to team with Russia. You know, why don't we use, why don't we team with Russia and have them help us? Which we have. You know, we've teamed with countries. Uh, when, when you when you start that. Uh, I said, if America starts that, then, then we will not control our, our space program. And we, we're pretty, pretty well lost control of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think that the commercial people are going to get very far. Uh, there's so much money and so much talent needed to, to you know, keep a real mission going. You know, and, and NASA did it well for a long time. I won't say how to do it now, <laughs> but for a long time they did a great job. And uh, uh, it, it's interesting what they're doing, but I, I don't think it will amount to much, to be honest with you. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I don't know. I, um, um, I, I can't help but wonder if somewhere back when airplanes were invented, and people looked around and said, oh, well, it's, uh, gonna, the military is going to use it, and the airplanes will probably never have any further use. True, I guess true. The dreamer, the field, hopes that space is that way too. It's, 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 well, somehow, some way, yeah. it becomes a I, I, I would love that to be, uh, yeah. Uh, it's so expensive, though, to get a pound of whatever up to wherever you're going. You know, the, God, you need all this energy to get that mass up there. It's just very expensive, yeah. Oh, uh, Kraft Ericke was on the first burial in space. Uh, which is a commercial <laughs> application. Well, yeah. they, they put him in orbit uh, with uh, uh, the, the guy that came up with Star Trek. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's up there with them. Yeah, they were only there for about three years. They, they, yeah, they re-entered. Well, it it it, it wasn't a good orbit. <laughs> it, it just wasn't a good orbit. Boy, if I paid that much, I'd want to be in a good orbit. <laughs> and, and, and most of the times, if you read about it, they, they tell you the date and the apogee and the perigee, and, uh, and they launched from an airplane over the Canary Island at 38,000 feet, and there it goes. Okay, They don't tell you the end game two or three, whatever it was, years later. Yeah. Re-entry. Sure. <laughs> there is, of course, one fundamental problem with space and that is the radiation load yeah. and I heard recently somebody say that actually for people coming let's say for, for the moon the backscattered or back generated radiation load that comes back from the cosmic ray hitting the moon, lunar soil and being re irradiated is more dangerous than the direct cosmic ray. Yes I, I have heard that. On this? Yes, that, that, that seems to be the case, right. Uh, somebody is working on a, uh, a, a shield, <laughs> a radiation shield. The, the, a lot of people have been working on that for years. It was kind of the counterpart kind of to the gravitational, you know, zero weightlessness, yeah. That, that's easier done than what you're talking about, yeah, to actually put up a shield to, to protect us from that. But you're right, there is more backscatter than, than the direct way, yeah, yeah, sure. And don't ever forget Flash Gordon. That Flash Gordon character, he really lit me up. <laughs> sure. You mentioned Operation Paperclip, and he mentioned the military. Yeah. So in your career, did you run into the guys who were working on the secret corona program, uh, doing in intelligent satellites above the Earth? Did you, because Hughes and all those other companies were involved in all that thing simultaneously, and the, the people involved with the space telescope in particular, Chasen, chastised uh, the, the lack of communications with the military space program and the civilian program. Yeah, well, on, on what now? Did you, did you encounter those guys? 
uh, in your terms of your career, the, the, the secret military space program as opposed to the... Uh, yes, I, I was involved with a couple of black, black programs. Yes, I was. Uh, even at Aerojet, when we had the spy satellite. Yeah, we had the spy satellite, uh, which was, it count, we'd, we'd monitor every Russian launch. Okay. During the Seven Day War, let me see if I get this right, the Seven Day War, uh, both, let's see, it was Egypt and Israel, right? Uh, both sides were claiming kills on their airplanes beyond like three times more than the airplanes they had. So they, they, they called a couple of us in, can we uh, accommodate finding airplane, uh, airplanes in air being burst, blown up, you know, missile strikes. And uh, we did, we were able to ch ch change the scan pattern and stuff. And uh, so we were able to count airplanes being shot down. Yeah, which was a, at the time was a black program, yeah. I can talk about that. <laughs> well, no, I've, I've actually seen I've actually seen the Corona film. It's on display at the National Archives. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can see you can you can see the, the the pads in on the Egyptian air bases, with the with the uh, the targeted ground blasted blasted from the air. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I was kind of playing around the edges of that. Yeah. Yeah. But the the the, the black programs are fine. Uh, the uh, you know they 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 sometimes push you into directions you, you weren't going to, and they give you money and you can learn a lot. And then next thing you know, you're making a snap tent or something, you know, that pops out. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody can use it, yeah. <laughs> sure, thank you. Well, let's, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, thank you. Thank you.